Hello, this is Dr. Jordanoff, and this is a brief lecture on bone tumors. Over the next few minutes, I would like to teach you a logical and organized approach for analyzing bone lesions. I'm going to show you what to look for, what to say, and also what not to say when characterizing and describing bone tumors. One way that you could approach memorizing all the different bone tumors is by brute force. And to do that, you typically need some kind of mnemonic. This is one of the more popular ones, Phagnomashic. It lists all the different lytic bone tumors. Now, I think that that's a terrible way to approach this problem. And let me demonstrate why I think so. These lesions that are listed here look very different from one another. In fact, they're often as different as apples and frogs. For example, non-ossifying fibroma is one of the classic do not touch lesions. It is non-aggressive in appearance. It actually resolves and heals spontaneously without any treatment. Infection, on the other hand, is very aggressive in appearance. In fact, it's in the same differential as Ewing sarcoma. NOF is always diametaphyseal in location. Chondroblastoma, on the other hand, is epiphyseal in location. Giant cell tumor is characterized by the lack of sclerosis along its margin, while NOF always has a sclerotic margin. Myeloma occurs in the elderly, while chondroblastoma occurs in children. So, I hope I've demonstrated with these few examples that the lesions contained in this laundry list are very different from one another. They're not going to be in the same differential when you're analyzing a bone tumor. They either look different or are located in different locations or they affect totally different patient populations. Why then should you waste mental power memorizing such a list of conditions? Instead, let me show you how a musculoskeletal radiologist approaches the analysis of a bone tumor. There are a number of things that you should look at, and each of them is very important because it narrows the differential possibilities considerably. We're going to look at patient's age, the lesion multiplicity, the lesion location, as well as the lesion morphology in characterizing bone tumors. Let's look at them one at a time. We'll start by talking about the importance of patient age. I'd like you to remember that you really don't need to know the precise patient age. What you do have to do is fit your patient in one of these three categories. Is the patient a child, a young adult, or an older adult? That's all you need to do. How are we going to do that? Well, look at the nearest joint. I look at the nearest growth plate. If it's still open, then the patient is a child. If the nearest growth plate is closed, we have to do a little more digging. Look at the nearest joint for degenerative change. Look at the bone mineralization. Look for atherosclerotic calcifications in the soft tissues. If these features are all absent, if the nearest joint looks totally normal, then you're probably dealing with a young adult. If on the other hand, we have a lot of degenerative changes in the nearest joint, the bones look demineralized and we have atherosclerotic calcifications in the soft tissues, then the patient is elderly. The location of the lesion in the bone is very important. Certain lesions tend to live in certain places. Along the length of the bone, lesions are diaphyseal, metaphyseal, or epiphyseal. For example, fibrous dysplasia tends to be in the diaphysis or metaphysis of bones. Simple bone cysts are usually metaphyseal. Chondroblastoma and giant cell tumor are epiphyseal in location. 
you should further characterize the lesion in relation to the long axis of the bone. Lesions can be central or eccentric. As an example, fibrous dysplasia and non-ossifying fibroma are two fibrous tumors which look very much alike, but they differ in their location. Fibrous dysplasia is usually central, while non-ossifying fibroma is always eccentric. Next, we're going to look at lesion behavior, the pattern of bone destruction, the bone response to the lesion, and the pattern of matrix calcification. Lesions can either have a narrow zone of transition or a wide zone of transition. What do we mean by that? Here, at the top left, I've drawn a lesion with a narrow zone of transition. If I gave you a pencil and asked you to draw around this lesion, you would have no problem doing so. That's because there is a very narrow zone of transition between the lesion and the neighboring normal bone. In this case, you see that this lesion is uh, encircled or cloaked by a thin sclerotic margin. This means that this lesion has been there for a very long time. It's a long-standing lesion. The bone has had time to respond to it and try to contain it with this rim of sclerosis. On the bottom here, I've drawn an aggressive lesion. And you can see that the zone of transition between the lesion and the normal bone is very wide. If I asked you to draw around this lesion, you would have trouble doing so because there would be a lot of uncertainty about where the lesion ends and where the normal bone begins. Lesions with a wide zone of transition are aggressive. They're fast growing and the, the bone does not have time to contain such a lesion. Let's talk about osteolysis patterns briefly. This is according to the AFIP classification. Lesions are either geographic or poorly defined. Geographic lesions are those around which you could draw. You could see the margin of the lesion very well. And such lesions can have a complete rim of sclerosis around them, or only a partial rim of sclerosis, or even no sclerosis at all. All of these, however, are still geographic. As we go from type 1A to type 1C, the aggressiveness of the lesion increases. Poorly defined lesions are type 2 or 3, and these are called moth-eaten or permutative, respectively. Moth-eaten lesions have multiple discrete holes uh, within the bone, like a sweater that's been eaten by a moth. In primitive osteolysis, we don't even see discrete holes. The bone in that region is just lysed away. It's permeated by the lytic process. These are very similar uh, in aggressivity. They're both very aggressive. and Things like osteomyelitis or Ewing sarcoma or lymphoma would present with this pattern of osteolysis. I've mentioned the term aggressive several times, and that's because in musculoskeletal radiology, we prefer the term aggressive to the term malignant. And why is that? It's because there's a lot of overlap. Both aggressive, malignant neoplastic conditions and non Neoplastic conditions such as osteomyelitis can produce this pattern of osteolysis. Here we have a radiograph of the distal tibia, and in the distal tibial metaphysis, we have an area of moth eaten osteolysis. This is not a neoplasm, this is osteomyelitis. The type of periosteal new bone formation is very important. Periosteal New bone formation can be characterized as either solid or interrupted. Solid new bone formation is non-aggressive. We see this with healing stress fractures. We see it with long-standing benign conditions such as osteoosteoma. Interrupted periosteal new bone formation is aggressive, and we typically see this with aggressive neoplasms such as Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma or metastatic disease. At the top here is an example of hair on end or sunburst type of periosteal reaction. In the middle, 
I've shown lamellated periosteal reaction, and at the bottom I've drawn a Codman's triangle. Again, all of these interrupted types of periosteal reaction are aggressive. There are three types of matrix calcification pattern. The first is cloud-like. When you see clouds of density within the soft tissue, as we do here, we're dealing with an osteoid-producing neoplasm, a bone-producing neoplasm, such as an osteosarcoma. When we see discrete dots of calcification, punctate calcifications within a lesion, we're dealing with a cartilage-producing neoplasm. This is chondroid matrix calcification. When we see ground glass matrix calcification, the, these smudged trabeculae, we're dealing with a fibrous lesion. Now, please be aware that these terms, cloud-like, punctate, and ground glass, are very specific buzzwords. So when you say cloud-like, you have committed to an osteoid-producing neoplasm. You cannot say cloud-like and then proceed to talk about a fibrous lesion. This is very, very helpful when characterizing bone lesions. For example, if you have a lesion which is producing punctate matrix calcifications, you know that this is a cartilage-forming tumor. Now all you have to do is decide whether the lesion is non-aggressive and therefore a low-grade cartilage neoplasm such as an enchondroma or an aggressive lesion which has destroyed the cortex and we're seeing chondroid calcifications in the soft tissues and in such a case we would be dealing with a chondrosarcoma. Don't say there is no matrix because the chances are that you would be wrong. Only one lesion is truly hollow and has no matrix centrally, and that's a unicameral bone cyst. If appropriate, say, there is no appreciable matrix calcification. There are many lytic tumors which do not produce a calcified matrix. Remember that the best way to evaluate bone lesions is with conventional radiographs. We use MRI to, ass to assess the extent of disease and that's particularly important with aggressive tumors which have a wide zone of transition. It's basically impossible to tell on conventional radiographs where these lesions begin and end within the bone. So we use MRI to, ex to assess the extent of disease, to assess the degree of soft tissue involvement, to see what's happening to the neighboring nerves and vessels, uh, and we do all this to assist with preoperative planning. We also use MRI in the postoperative state to assess for residual or recurrent neoplasm. Sometimes we use CT to define the matrix calcifications, to look for fractures, and to assess the degree of soft tissue involvement. We use bone scan and PET-CT to assess for distant metastases in order to stage the patient. A few final bits of advice. Always start with the findings. Describe the lesion using the categories that I've discussed. Don't start with a presumptive diagnosis and then search the lesion for findings that fit your initial assumption. Your description should lead you to either one unique diagnosis or to a very short list of differential possibilities, two or three conditions. Again, there is no need for long lists that include all of the lytic lesions because you would never be considering all of the lytic lesions for the specific tumor that you're evaluating. After all, you're dealing with a patient that falls in a age category and with a tumor which is located in a very specific location. Don't ever end your discussion with, this couldn't be such and such, or I don't think this is blank. In my experience, when a resident starts a sentence with these words, they invariably name the correct diagnosis. If you're unsure what the lesion is, just start naming hard facts. Name the type of study. 
Start talking about the views or the sequences that you have in front of you and then start making findings. When you do that, it helps you in two regards. One, you buy yourself some time and I'm not advocating that you procrastinate indefinitely. Sooner or later you have to commit. Uh, but it does buy you some time. The second thing that this accomplishes is it helps you approach the lesion, the description and the analysis from the finding side. Lastly, I'm going to show you this one example and show you how I would approach taking a case. Here we have an AP radiograph of the right hip and within the septrochanteric right femur we have an oval, well circumscribed lytic lesion. The lesion has ground glass matrix calcification centrally and a well-defined sclerotic border. There is a very narrow zone of transition. The lesion is centrally located within the femur. It is mildly expansile medially, but there is no cortical destruction or breakthrough. There is no aggressive osteolysis. There is no periosteal newborn formation. There is no pathologic fracture. These are the classic features of fibrous dysplasia. Notice that this lesion is so characteristic there really is no differential diagnosis. What if the lesion were eccentric? Well, in that case, the diagnosis would have been non-ossifying fibroma. I hope that this was a helpful mini lecture. Thank you for your attention.